If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some gamer score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Z Retro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last. Sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. That's better. Right. Well, birthday celebrations out of the way. Voice is still recovering from WrestleMania. And I'll get into that at some point next week. But anyway. Hello, my fellow Latter-day Saints. Kenzie, the Mormon Entertainer here, the most inspirational Mormon in all of Asia. And I am back with the best way to start the weekend... The Trophy Achievement Podcast, the best place for all your latest gaming news, rumours, and of course, those sweet points and trophies. So, we have got a very juicy edition of the podcast today. Uh, We have got the winners of the 2018 Gaming BAFTAs. We are going to reveal the winners for those and what my thoughts are. There we go, that will do nicely. So we've got the winners there. And what my thoughts are on who won what. Uh, Alright, NXT take up New Orleans, you're going to need to wait. Uh, What we've also got, uh, we've got we've got a new wave of OG Xbox games coming to backwards compatibility, including a lot of Star Wars games with the with the release of the solo Star Wars film coming out in a couple of months. Um, Well, just that, there's a new character announced for Soul Calibur 6. Fortnite Battle Royale um, has uh, some has some freebies to say sorry for some uh, delays regarding something, but we'll find out there. Um, Is Retro Gaming, is Retro Game Collecting dead? We will find out um, about that shortly. Um, um, uh, an unexpected source is going to bring in Nintendo Switch's next wave of hardware. What that's going to be, we'll find out here. Um, uh, God of War, some God of War news. There's a Kratos mod for Grand Theft Auto V. We'll read about that one. Um, what else is there? NetherRealm celebrates Superman's 80th birthday in in the Injustice 2 mobile game. Uh, Grand Theft Auto V has made some pretty big history. But what is that history defining moment? We will find out here. And of course, uh, I have managed to find not one, but two gaming screw-ups of the week. Both from unsurprisingly Activision and Electronic Arts. What are those screw-ups? We'll find out here. And in the points and trophies section, we are going to be going through the achievements for Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which came out on Xbox One last, uh, just earlier this week, in fact. All that plus the Biggest gaming story to come out possibly this year, next to the Grand Theft Auto V history, is that Spyro the Dragon is finally being remastered. It has officially been announced and we have a release date for the trilogy. What is it all what does this all mean? We will find out right here on the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Before we get into the news, as always, a big shout out to my good friends over at Boomerang Rentals, the best place to rent your games. Packages start from as little as £3.99 a month. Sign up today, get a 21 day free trial and three free game rentals. You can rent a game a week and you are sorted. And not just that, you can keep the games as long as you like and keep them forever as well at a discounted price from the online store. There are no late fees, so you can essentially Keep the games, complete the games, 100% them, get the Platinum Trophy or 1,000 Gamer Score, or maybe both, and send it back with no late fees to worry about. BoomerangRentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Now, uh, I've got a pizza here ready to eat, 
Uh, got some refreshments, well, beverages even. So let's get into the news. So hit the scrub jingle, maestro, as we look at this week's Scrubs of the Week. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. <laughs> Uh, let's start with Activision first. Uh, is Activision Blizzard's Destiny a dying franchise? Answer, yes. Despite, a despite posting a strong launch, Activision's Destiny 2 appears to be in trouble. Why does that not surprise me? Activision Blizzard's Destiny 2 put up strong release numbers and received good reviews from critics when it debuted last September. But the game's player base is dwindling. Recent comments ma from management also seem to support the idea that the game is floundering, a significant setback for a property that has been important to Activision's growth story in recent years. Um, no, their growth mainly comes from Call of Duty, and even then they don't make any progress. Should investors be concerned that Destiny is heading down the path towards irrelevance? Yes, because it's already hit that point. How did Destiny get here? Following Destiny 2's release, Activision Blizzard announced that the game had surpassed its prequel's first week engagement metrics. That, that was a promising indicator that Destiny 2 was off to a good start. The game released on console platforms on September 6th and wound up on, as North America's second highest grossing game of 2017. So there's reason to think that strong performance continued past launch week. Now it's hard to deny that the title is in a troubled state. Management certainly didn't... Management certainly didn't... Oh, goodness me. Management certainly didn't do it the company's earnings call in February. Here's the, C Here's the CEO of the company Activision segment, Eric Hirschberg, giving some of the giving some context on how Destiny 2 went from being a hit to being hated by its player base. Simple, it's basically the same as the first game and it absolutely sucks. Now after that, meaning after players had poured a significant amount of hours already into the game, we, had, we have definitely seen some real sentiment issues surface in a couple of areas. How about all of the areas because you can't deal with the fact that you can't make a game that isn't Call of Duty properly? And we have got plans to address those. Mm, how about... Uh, oh, I have an idea. How about we turn this into another Call of Duty game? That's all Activision think. If Activision... Think Call of Duty? They think, yes, me like, let's make Call of Duty. For example, one of the things is we wanted to do, one of these, one of the things we wanted to do with Destiny 2 was to make the game a little bit of less of a grind. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. It's not happening. It's an online only game, so obviously there's going to be a grind. Based on feedback we heard, which you never took into account. Something tells me Activision and EA are practically the same company at this point. And we also wanted to provide players with more direct paths to getting the game's best rewards. Ah yes, through microtransactions of course. And that actually allowed our core players to consume the content faster than we anticipated. Yeah, because you gave them microtransactions to take the shortcuts. And that has led to an increase in players calling for more challenges and better rewards in the ongoing game. One of the takeaways here is that the Destiny franchise once again debuted a major installment that was lacking in content. Why does that not surprise me? EA's reboot of Battlefront, anyone? Some reports suggest that the Destiny 2 project was dramatically retooled late in development. Oh, good grief, no wonder it tanked. Which would do a lot to explain that deficiency. However, the objections from players are not limited to the game being light on things to do. Customers also seem to be dissatisfied, dissatisfied with changes to the fundamental gameplay experience. Things like how fast players move, character attributes, and enemy variety 
and the fact the game absolutely sucks. Overall, the user base seems to want the game's developer to revert the game's mechanics closer to those of its franchises, of the franchise's predecessor. Activism President and Chief Operating Officer Cody, uh, Cody Johnson noted during the last earnings call that the game's developer has made changes to the experience and said they have been positively received by the player base. Why not release the game with all the content at launch and then nobody is disappointed? Because that's what happened back in the day. Once you got a game, once you got a game, that was it. It had everything on there. Now it's all about the money. <clears throat> right. But that doesn't seem to be the case, even as more dramatic updates have been ruled out, as I have just explained. A significant misstep for Activision Blizzard, primarily Activision because they're the ones that started the franchise. I am not blaming Blizzard because they're always good. Activision are failures of the gaming industry. The need to deliver on the content front is something the company publicly addressed years before Destiny 2 released. Um, we don't know how to put all the content in our games. And for that, we are not sorry. Deal with it, you haters. You see how easy it is for me to pick apart these companies? Now, I would be a bit more over the top with this, but like, but like I said, my voice is still recovering because I practically ruined it at a sports bar down in Manchester when I was watching WrestleMania. Like I said, I'll get into that shortly. Um, it was the single biggest complaint when the first Destiny debuted back in 2014. So not having that weakness addressed for the launch of the sequel is a clear failure. Yep, why does that not surprise me? Activision Bungie came up short. Came up short here. Whether or not Destiny 2 experienced significant setback during its development, it most likely did. The product has not met customer expectations and that has implications for the future of the franchise and i'm just gonna leave it at that my point my point stands my point still stands ladies and gentlemen my point stands activision failed they failed with destiny one they failed with destiny two why does it not surprise me the only thing they talk about is Call of Duty. And talking of failures, EA and the infamous scandal that is Scandal Front 2. Uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. The sorry, the botched Star Wars Battlefront 2. Right, here we go. What is the date today? 13th. Goody! Brace yourselves! Brace yourself, people. Microtransactions are returning. That's right. EA is bringing back in-game purchases for Star Wars Battlefront 2, officially on April 18th. I'm just going to leave it at that, because microtransactions should never be in a Star Wars Battlefront game. They should have they should have been never introduced in the game to begin with. They should have only used the in-game progression system, which should have been a lot quicker than it actually was and is. The microtransactions in Star Wars Battlefront 2 should have never been thought of, left to the side, never be seen again.
The microtransactions are basically for the cosmetic items rather than weapons and characters and all that jazz. But my point still stands. EA destroyed Battlefront, the Battle, the Star Wars Battlefront Legacy. Disney, take the license off EA. Never give it to them again, please. On lighter subjects, the British Academy Game Awards took place just yesterday, in fact. So, here we go. This is what we had. Let's start from the bottom. BAFTA Fellowship, Tim Schafer. Now, what has Tim Schafer done? Tim Schafer. Ah! Looks aha, of course. Spent over a decade at LucasArts with games such as Full Throttle, Grim Fandango, Psychonauts, Brutal Legend, and Broken Age. And of course, assistant designer for Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge. So, winning the BAFTA Fellowship Award, Tim Schafer. Kudos to you. Right. Let's see what we got. Uh, performer, the winner. I was like, I'm just going to go through the winners here. Uh, Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. Or, uh, Senua. Melina Jurgens. If that's how you pronounce it. If it's not, I apologize. Uh, best original property. Horizon Zero Dawn. Finally, it actually wins an award at a major ceremony. Thank you. Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, best narrative. Night in the Woods. Best Music, Cuphead. Yes! Another award for Cuphead. Uh, multiplayer, Divinity Origin Sin 2. Best mobile game is Golf Clash. Oh, the Stranger Things game got nominated. Good, good. Uh, game Innovation, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Game Design, Super Mario Odyssey. That's two awards for Nintendo. Good uh, game Beyond Entertainment, Hellblade. Best Family Game, Super Mario Odyssey. Evolving Game, Overwatch. I'm just surprising. A debut game, Goro Goro Goa, if that's how you pronounce it. Uh, best British game, Hellblade. Audio achievement, Hellblade. Artistic achievement, Hellblade. And best game, What Remains of Edith Finch. Interesting. So Hellblade received nine nominations and took home five awards last night. So, well done, Hellblade. Remind me to get a copy of the game, guys. And while we are celebrating the best of games, uh, we are celebrating Superman's 80th birthday. Well, Netherrealm is. Uh, in the Injustice 2 mobile game. The red underwear has returned! One of the most beloved characters in all of fiction is DC's Golden Boy, the Man of Steel, son of Krypton. Uh, Superman! He has successfully made the jump from the comic panels to the silver screen, and he's even been in a couple of successful games, such as the Injustice series. At least they didn't acknowledge Superman 64. Good grief, that was awful. He has had a long history, and this year we'll be celebrating his 80th birthday. To celebrate, Netherrealm will be adding a special Superman variant in the mobile version of Injustice 2. The team has gone back to the very start, and are giving Superman his original costume as seen in Action Comics number 1. Yes, that includes the classic red underwear on the outside of the suit. There's even, an o there's even a whole... There's even an homage to the classic cover of Action Comics number 1 in the form of a special move where he throws a green car at his phone. Classic Superman will also invade matches in the arena at random. If players can take him down, they'll earn some hero shards. As of right now, there are no details on if Classic Superman will make an appearance in the console or PC versions of Injustice 2. Injustice 2 Mobile is available for iOS and Android right now. Congratulations, Netherrealm. Now let's get another Mortal Kombat game. Please. 
It's like, please, can we get another Mortal Kombat game, please? Right, Grand Theft Auto news now, and Grand Theft Auto 5 has become the most profitable entertainment product of all time! Yes, entertainment product, not just the most profitable game. The most profitable entertainment product. Right, here we go. Rockstar's 2013 open world venture into the criminal underbelly of their fictionalized satirical take on Los Angeles, known as Grand Theft Auto V, made massive waves at launch by making over one billion dollars in three days, but nearly five years later, it has become something larger than anyone would have ever predicted. To date, the third person crime thriller has sold an astounding 90 million units across Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS4, and PC, and has retained its starting $60 price point since 2013. No wonder they're making so much money, they've kept the price tag the same. Only dipping for occasional sales, but no permanent price drops. This is pretty much unheard of for the, mass, for the vast majority of games, with Call of Duty's top selling entries only being able to push about 25 million units. There have even been additional SKUs of the game for more money that give new players a boost in the insanely popular multiplayer mode GTA Online. On a reported budget of $265 million, Grand Theft Auto V profited in its first week and has drastically multiplied that since then to accumulate an estimated $6 billion. Yes, billion with a B, capital B. Roughly double the amount James Cameron's film Avatar made, which holds the record of being the highest grossing film of all time. If we adjust for inflation, Gone with the Wind is the highest grossing film with adjusted inflation. Video games are a much better business than movie studios, says KeyBank analyst Evan Wingren. Uh, he said this when speaking to MarketWatch. Games in general have the enviable position that their content is interactive, which allows them to make data-driven insights and adjust games and business models that benefit players and the company. With that said, Grand Theft Auto V has achieved the status of being the most profitable entertainment product of, to date, crushing Star Wars, Call of Duty, and any superhero movie ever made. Yeah, it even eclipses the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's insane! Thanks to its longevity, Rockstar has been able to pump out more and more content to keep players coming back to their lucrative online mode which features microtransactions that Rockstar can continue to make even more money off of long after player dr people dropped their initial $60. For the last few years, people have been wondering if Rockstar will be able to do it all over again with 2018's Red Dead Redemption 2, or the inevitable Grand Theft Auto 6. Red Dead Redemption 2 has already been confirmed to follow a similar formula to Grand Theft Auto 5, with an ever-growing online mode that will surely be a cash cow for years to come, and Grand Theft Auto 6 will likely do the same, but analysts are sceptical that they could do it again. That is actually a very valid point, because... Next to Grand Theft Auto V, the most popular game in the series is San Andreas. And that came out 14 years ago on the PS2 and original Xbox. Sorry folks. 
Talked up with the cult since I got back from Manchester on Monday as well, which is, like I say, not pleasant. That's not to say Rockstar won't have any other big hits. It may, but another Grand Theft Auto V isn't likely. That doesn't mean to say it won't happen, said Cowan analyst Doug Krutz. When speaking to Market Watch, Michael Jackson had a lot of hit albums. But he only had one thriller. Most it's the most it's the biggest selling album of all time. And it's gonna be 35 years old this year. Only time will tell. Rockstar has been a household name for years thanks to their controversial nature, but Grand Theft Auto V has helped cement them in pop culture history. Saying that Seeing that instantly recognisable simple logo on a box or reading Rockstar Games Presents in a trailer will surely be enough to sell people on future games alone. Rockstar's next game Red Dead Redemption 2 will take players away from the sun-soaked streets of a modern day parody of California and throw them headfirst into the brutal and unforgiving heartland of America during the peak of the wild wild west. Red Dead Redemption 2 will release on October 26, 2018 for Xbox One and PlayStation 4. And sticking with Grand Theft Auto V, Kratos makes an appearance in Grand Theft Auto V. And you're thinking, how does he do that? It's a Kratos mod. Wait, and their sub-headline says, Waiter, there's a Spartan in my San Andreas. <laughs> anyway. If you're more mouse and keyboard than DualShock 4, you're probably feeling a little sore at all the, at all those rapturous God of War reviews that hit today. The bad news is, they're right, and you're missing out. The good news is that you can still experience some Kratos magic on PC, thanks to a special, very special, GTA 5 mod. Spotted by PC gamer Lei Twang K's Kratos, God of War 3 Grand Theft Auto 5 mod features the Ghost of Sparta, complete with his Blades of Chaos, and it's a little bit weird watching the mighty Kratos smash his way through San Andreas or try to punch the crap out of a biplane. <laughs> but weird is what the modern community does best. If you're going if you're going to rush and install this, just make sure you follow all the installation instructions and practice safe modding. We're not responsible if you act recklessly and download digital herpes onto your hard drive or anything. <laughs> Lei Tuan Kai is a busy bee in the modding community. He's also knocked out files for Marvel's Black Panther, Rocket from Guardians of the Galaxy, and a Robocop bike. Don't worry about ending up on Rockstar's naughty list. Last year, the company gave modding the green light with an official statement. Rockstar Games believes in reasonable fan creativity and in particular wants creators to showcase their passion for our games, it said. After discussions with Take-Two, Take-Two has agreed that it generally will not take legal action against third party third party projects involving Rockstar's PC games that are single player, non-commercial and respect the intellectual property rights of the third parties. Well, Kratos in Grand Theft Auto. Who'd have thought we'd see the day? Next thing you know we're going to have the rest of the Avengers in uh, Grand Theft Auto 5. Mind you, they probably do at this point, but... Anyway. It's time to celebrate with our fellow 90s kids as Spyro the Dragon Remastered Trilogy officially comes to PS4 this September. We're finally getting the Spyro Remaster. Now Activision, remaster the Jack and Daxter Trilogy and then I will be satisfied. 
We are deep into a new era of gaming where only the vi where the only video game mascots that still hold a prominent place in society are Master Chief, Mario, and Sonic. Activision is looking to revive some of their old IPs in the form of epic remasters for Crash Bandicoot and now Spyro the Dragon. Yes, after months of rumours, which I have reported on on the podcast, and seemingly years of people begging, Activision has confirmed they are remastering the first three Spyro the Dragon games for Xbox One and PS4. The, tri the trilogy will release this September, a month that is gearing up to be a chaotic time for gamers, with Spider-Man, Dragon Quest, and a new Tomb Raider game coming out. And many others dropping in just, dropping in just days of each other. The collection is being dubbed Spiral Reignited Trilogy and will release on September 21st, 2018 for $40. Activision has remade the trilogy from the ground up with improved environments, updated controls, brand new lighting and recreated cinematics. Activision also promises full analog stick support and smooth camera handling. So this will be a very smooth and modernized version of the classic platformers. While some were hoping the game would come to Nintendo Switch and PC like Crash Bandicoot is, Activision has only announced the game for Xbox One and PS4. There have been some credible sources suggesting a Nintendo Switch version will come later, and Nintendo even listed the game on their own storefront. Could that be an error? Possibly. If it is coming, it likely won't hit in September unless Nintendo is saving a reveal for it during a Nintendo Direct in the next few months. Right, let's have a look at this trailer. So, three, two, one. Excellent, thank you very much. Bring them on! <laughs> Wow, that looks amazing. <laughs> Seems sick, Burns. Brilliant. Right. Fortnite Battle Royale back up and running, but 50 on 50 has unfortunately been delayed. And yet, an Epic says sorry with some free stuff. Nice. Epic has sounded the all clear on Fortnite, but the 50v50 limited time mode that was meant to be live today, um, and when I say live today, it was yesterday meant to go live yesterday has been pushed back to next week as a way and as a way of apology for all the trouble the studio has handed out some freebies to players a free troll stash llama in save the world and a big bling gift in battle royale this weekend and then next week a pack of battle stars for battle royale players and seasonal gold for save the world players a detailed post-mortem of what went wrong and how Epic will hopefully avoid this kind of gong show in the future is also on the way. Hmm. Ah, that is unfortunate. But, nevertheless, good to see Fortnite back up and running. And don't worry folks, I'll be back up and running to 100% very soon. <laughs> That's actually quite catchy. <laughs> now, let's get everybody's thoughts on this. Is retro game collecting 
dead. Or to put it another way, have we seen the end of retro game collecting as a hobby? This is a topic that has reared its ugly head on many gaming forums and YouTube videos over the course of the last year and has split the opinion of the gaming community in two. And this was by Steve Miggan on Power Up Gaming. And this is what he had to say. Personally, this is a subject very close to my heart. As an avid game collector myself, I have seen many changes and trends in the hobby over the course of the eight years since I started taking collecting seriously. Hmm. On one side of the camp, there has been a lot of commentary stating that the recent boom of YouTubers whose content focuses on the growth and display of their personal gaming collections, me, along with Let's Plays and Streams, has caused a spike in interest that has caused game prices to skyrocket. Whilst there has certainly been an increase in the amount of tubers who have actively in, who have become actively involved in retro in the retro gaming community, is this really a terrible thing? I'm happy to say that my experience of the community has been a very positive one overall. Traveling, traveling to several gaming conventions, meeting new people, and sharing stories and memories of these classic games really has been something I have treasured. So surely all these people now flocking to the hobby is just raising more awareness and adding more variety to the gaming community. The true reason for retro inflation. However, there has been a lot of commentary on how the increase in attention to game collecting has caused prices to skyrocket and titles that would have cost you £10 a few years ago have now tripled or even quadrupled in price due to demand. Can we blame all this on newcomers to the scene and the attention it has gathered over recent years though? There is one obvious factor that quite a lot of people seem to be ignoring throughout this argument. Time. Time is something that we as humans do not like to look at in detail, probably because it scares us. How many articles have you seen online written by millennials who are shocked at how quickly their adult lives are passing them by? What has this got to do with collecting retro games though? I hear you ask. Well, let's think about what draws a lot of people to retro games. A little thing called nostalgia. We love to collect and play these games because it takes us back to a simpler time. A time where we would rush home from school and throw ourselves into yet another adventure with Mario, Sonic or one of many other classic gaming heroes, like Spyro the Dragon which I just reported on earlier. We tend to look back on these times fondly. We try to emulate them by buying up the games of our childhood before, inevitably putting them on the shelf to play one day as adult responsibilities often mean free time is a luxury. Which is a very valid point because I rarely touch my I rarely touch my Xbox and PlayStation because I'm busy working on my YouTube channel all the time. Let's see. Let's see. If you're one of the old school collectors who remember the good old days of picking up Super Nintendo cartridges for 50p at your local car boot sale, then I implore you to think about how time has moved on since then. Take yourself back 10 years to 2008. Ah, 2008. That was a good year of gaming. Let's see what we had. What did we have? Um, Burnout Paradise. Super Smash Brothers Brawl came out the, uh, that year as well. Devil May Cry 4. Uh, Lost Odyssey, 
Um, what else was there? Let's keep scrolling. Let's keep scrolling. Yeah, Bully Scholarship Edition. That's just a re release. Um, oh, we had a Worms game, a Space Oddity. Um, Ratchet and Clank Size Matters. We had a Ratchet and Clank game. Sega Superstars Tennis. Pokemon Ranger. Shadows of Almia. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII. Uh, Mario Kart Wii. Uh, Okami got re released on the Wii as well. Um, Grand Theft Auto 4. It's one of the big releases. Uh, what else was there? Mass Effect came to PC. Lego Indiana Jones. Um, Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots, Battlefield Bad Company, excuse me, Unreal Tournament 3, uh, Beijing 2008, an official license game for the uh, 2008 uh, uh, Olympic Games, um, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, uh, Ratchet and Clank Future Quest for Booty. Uh, what else was there? Uh, let's keep scrolling. Um, what else was there? Uh, Pokemon Platinum came out. Uh, in Japan, it was. Uh, gold, silver, ruby, sapphire, emerald. Uh, hang on. Right here we go. Right, red, blue, yellow, gold, silver, crystal. Diamond and Pearl, of course. Diamond and Pearl. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Pokemon Platinum. Uh, Mega Man Nine on the WiiWare. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is uh, this is the meaty end of the. This is the meaty end of this. this is Saints Row Two. Original Dead Space. Far Cry 2, Guitar Hero World Tour, Fallout 3, Little Big Planet, Tom Clancy's End War, Gears of War 2, there was a lot out, there was a lot out uh, during 2008 and it was a pretty good year all round. Take yourself back 10 years to 2008 and say you stumbled across a Sega Mega Drive title that was released in 1990. I'm trying to think what it could have been. Anyway, um, that game would have been 18 years old at that point and could quite safely be classed as retro. Well, 10 years have passed since then. That Mega Drive game, much like myself, is now pushing 30 years old. I mean, I turned 25 last week. A lot of things can happen to a physical object in 30 years. To paint a clearer picture, think about the games of 10 years ago. Games released in 2008, so we're talking about Xbox 360, PS3 and Nintendo Wii. Take a wander down to your friendly local video game store, such as CEX, and tell me what you see. Bucket loads of titles for the aforementioned consoles for prices ranging from one to five pounds. Seem familiar? Yes, it does. Vintage versus retro. I personally think that as collectors we are inherently stuck in the past. Well, I suppose that is one of the big drawbacks we've got to take into account. It's what we know 
and how we roll as such. We are still living for those childhood days, but don't realize that a lot of these YouTubers we are throwing our hate at weren't even born when the original PlayStation was released. I was around when the PlayStation was released. I've been there from the start of PlayStation and Xbox. I've been there since day one for both console companies. I've been there since day one for Microsoft and Sony. I mean, never mind anything that came before. What we are now seeking is vintage consoles and games and as such the price is going to match that description. You wouldn't go to an antique store and expect to pay jumble sale prices after all. Exactly. Alas, all of that is just my humble opinion as a collector who is going a bit greyer in, in the beard these days and you can take it and you can take it or leave it based on your own experiences. Personally, I loved all the attention that retro gaming has gained over these, over these past few years and it has made it much easier to access as much gaming goodness as I can possibly absorb. My advice to anyone looking to get into retro gaming is not to miss out on the golden opportunity to pick up those titles for the PS3 and Xbox 360 and Nintendo Wii whilst they are cheap. Exactly. I mean, the backwards compatibility program on Xbox which I'm going to get into shortly. I once met a gay- I once met a- no. I once met a gentleman at a gaming convention in London back in my younger, more naive days. I remember him very proudly telling me all about his complete PAL collection of NES games. I was completely in awe and declared this man my hero. I mean, a complete catalogue of NES games. That pretty much speaks for itself. But something didn't quite make sense. The guy had a decent enough job, owned his home. And supported a family. How on earth did he also have the money to chuck at games that went complete with their box and manual, as all his were, would usually set you back at least £30 a go, just for common sports titles? Then he revealed his simple secret. As he was about 15 years my senior, he told me all about when the game stores were making way for the next console generation. Around the, let, around the latter days of the SNES lifespan, everyone, everybody was hyped on the new dawn of 3D gaming. The Nintendo 64, the PlayStation, and Sega Saturn. Who on earth would be interested in that... Excuse me. Who on earth would be interested in that bargain bin of NES titles in the corner of the store, marked up for clearance at just a few pounds each? The guy I met, the guy I met, that's who. So he bought them up for pittance, stored them, and hey presto, all those years later, he had he only had a fraction of titles to pick up for slightly extortionate prices to complete his collection. Food for thought for any budding collectors out there. Start early, buy them cheap, and you'll be fine. What do you think? So I'm going to throw this out to you guys watching right now. What do you think about the recent popularity spike of retro gaming? Have the increased prices put you off the hobby entirely? Or do you welcome the fresh injection of passion into the community? I don't think this is something this is that's going to go away anytime soon because we've still got people collecting OG Xbox games. And it's going to get to a point now where they're going to dis They've already discontinued the Xbox 360. And you're going to have a lot of special editions for that. You're going to have a Halo Reach one. You're going to have a Gears of War one. And at the end of the day... If you decide to sell that collection later down the line, once it's complete... 
think of think of how worth it it will be with the amount of time and money you invested in building up that collection and then you sell that collection off absolutely worth it mm. right and talking of xbox we've got a new wave of original xbox games that are coming to backwards compatibility so here we go a new wave of original xbox games are headed to the xbox one thanks to backwards compatibility support microsoft announced today including beloved classics like the elder scrolls 3 morrowind star wars knights of the old republic 2 the sith lords jade empire and many more the full list of games will be split into two groups and deployed in the coming weeks with the first eight games available on april 17th followed by the second collection on april 26th this is the full breakdown here we go so on april 17th we have got blinks the time sweeper breakdown conquer live and reloaded the elder scrolls 3 morrowind the hunter hunter the reckoning jade empire bioware's Bioware's first attempt, or something, Mass Effect, uh, Mass Effect would be Jade Empire's spiritual successor, essentially. Because Jade Empire came, like, two years after, uh, before Mass Effect. Panzer Dragon Auto and SSX3. What about SSX Tricky? I'll be happy with that. And the games that are coming on April 26th. Destroy All Humans. Full Spectrum Warrior. Mercenaries Playground of Destruction. MX Unleashed. Panzer Elite Action Fields of Glory. But that's only available in Europe. And then we get into the Star Wars but games. Star Wars Battlefront. Star Wars Battlefront 2. The real Battlefront games I should add. These are the real Battlefront games, not the EA nonsense. Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, Jedi Starfighter, Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords, and Republic Commando. Microsoft's first 13 original backwards compatibility games were released in October 2017. To play original, uh, I mean, we all know, we all know how it works. To play original Xbox backwards compatibility games, just insert your original Xbox disc for any of these games into your Xbox console if you still have them, or if you own them digitally, that will also work. Many of these games can also be purchased from the Xbox Store. Microsoft also announced another round of classic Xbox 360 games receiving Xbox One enhancements today, including Red Dead Redemption, Portal 2, and Gears of War 2. Fusion Frenzy, that looks familiar. Right. Right, how long have I been recording for now? Hmm, fast approaching an hour. And we are at... Ooh, 7.45. Better get my skates on. Right. Be right back, folks. Right, here we go. We've got a new Soul Calibur. We've got a Soul Calibur character coming for Soul Calibur 6. 
do I seriously have to do this? There we go. Right, here we go. Bandai Namco has announced another addition to Soul Calibur 6 roster of fighters. Siegfried. Long-time players will no doubt be happy to see the giant sword wielding warrior return for the sixth entry as he is a popular character, alongside his corrupted counterpart, Nightmare, who is also set to appear. After losing to Kilik and his comrades in the form of Nightmare, Siegfried awoke in an unfamiliar place, and he is now unable to free himself from the unforgiving memories of his time spent as a cursed swords puppet. Reads the brief origin story for this version of Siegfried. The memory of having killed his own father is haunting him. His true nightmare has only just begun. Full of regrets, he is looking for redemption, and he desperately wants to free himself from the cursed sword's grasp. Based on the trailer, Siegfried is an angsty is as angsty as ever, but more importantly, still very handy with the steel. His barrage of sword attacks look deadly and will no doubt require opponents to constantly think about high-low mix-ups as well as ensure he isn't given too many openings, as once he gets going, he's difficult to stop. In March, Bandai Namco announced a guest character for Soul Calibur 6, and it was the Witcher's Geralt. We collaborated with Bandai Namco's artist to faithfully, re faithfully recreate Geralt, and shared original Witcher 3 Wild Hunt assets with Geralt's model, animations and weapons, said CD Projekt Red community lead Marcin Momont. I, I think that Bandai Namco did an outstanding job of capturing all the details and introducing The Witcher to Soul Calibur in a way fans of both series will enjoy. Since then it's been revealed that Geralt will also be featured on the Soul Calibur 6 cover. The game doesn't exactly, does not yet have a, an exact release date but it's due out for PS4, Xbox One, and PC sometime this year. So an old favourite is back in Soul Calibur 6. Thanks, Namco, you crazy maniacs. The only thing left to ask, does your soul still burn? Right, Nintendo Switch news. Their next wave of hardware will come from an unexpected place. Right, let's see. The Nintendo Switch is the company's least traditional console since, well, ever. It's not a home console per se, but it's more powerful than any handheld we've yet to see. It has classics like Mario, Zelda, and Mel Metroid, sure, but it also provides its youngest fans with zany DIY cardboard playsets that play collections of minigames. Now, Nintendo is taking its less than traditional approach to games and hardware overseas and bringing them straight into the heart of Silicon Valley. A new report says Nintendo will be partnering up with a venture capital firm to find startups to create new hardware and software for the Nintendo Switch. Reports, the report comes by way of Bloomberg, who says Nintendo will be partnering with San Francisco, California-based Scrum Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm with strong ties to Japan. Specifically, Nintendo is looking for hardware and software designs that will provide players with unique ways of interacting with Nintendo hardware. However, it says game design concepts will be excluded. Okay. 
neither Nintendo nor Scrum will invest directly in these ideas, however, but rather offer support and guidance bringing these devices to store shelves. Interesting. Nintendo's eccentric development ideas are nothing new. Most will remember how Nintendo broke new ground with the Nintendo Wii, one of the most successful consoles ever made. The Nintendo Switch, Nintendo Labo, and this new pilot program are all just an evolution of that concept of being different in all too similar feeling hardware space. Nintendo might not be able to compete with Microsoft's or Sony's high-powered gaming consoles, the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro, but it's not trying to. It's taking its own path up the mountain. So just when will we see these new experiences on store shelves and in our own homes? Scrum says they'll handpick startups in the next few months to prepare for a pitch meeting with Nintendo sometime in the later half of this year. If you, ever want to, if you ever wanted to work on a Nintendo product, here's your window of opportunity. And yesterday they made a correction saying that Scrum is accepting pitches for both hardware and software pitches. However, it will exclude game design concepts. Now what those concepts could be, I don't know. But anyway. That's the news out of the way, eventually. Now for the best part of the program, and it goes a little something like... Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Yep. <laughs> Points and trophies. 14 achievements in all. And I might as well go through them all. There are only, there's only one achievement that isn't a secret achievement in here, interestingly. Stories from the North basically collect all of the lore stones. 100 gamer score. Right, so let's have a look. Another rare achievement. Confront Hela, which is in the final battle. A secret. Uh, 100 gamer score. Tamed, tamed the Beast, defeat Fenrir. 90 gamer score. Into the Mountain, 90 gamer score, enter Helheim. Warrior, escape the Sea of the Corpses, 50 gamer score. Grammar released, pulled Grammar out of the tree, 90 gamer score. Escaped, uh, complete the Labyrinth Shard Challenge, only 30 gamer score for that one. Cure for the play, complete the Swamp Shard Challenge, 30 gamer score. Different Perspectives, complete the Tower Shard Challenge, 30 gamer score. Trust Your Senses, complete the Blindness Shard Challenge, 30 gamer score. Source of the Darkness, meet Hella for the first time on the bridge, 90 gamer score. Master of Illusion, 90 gamer score, defeat Val, Val, Val Raven. For 90 game score. Extinguished for 90 game score. Defeat Sutra. And the fight begins. 90 game score. Reaching the gate for the first time. We're putting that all together. And that gets you the elusive 1000 game score. So that is it for this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Uh, well. Where to begin? Feels good to be back. It's, like I say, back to business as usual. Tomorrow, Tom and Jerry Sins is back. Monday, I've got a music cover going up as well. And Tuesday and Wednesday, I am going to be reacting to the last few episodes of Season 8 of The Walking Dead. So you're definitely not going to want to miss those. But the series finale... Is going to the series finale is going to be one hundred percent live. I am going to be live streaming my live reactions for the series finale of The Walking Dead. So I'm going to have the reactions for the previous two episodes, the previous two episodes uh, beforehand. I'm going to have those up uh, as well. Um, then I am going to do how and then. Over the course of the next week, I'm going to have 
how WWE should have booked WrestleMania 34 because there was a there's a lot of things I would have booked differently. So, yes, I took that idea from uh, What Culture Wrestling. So, big shout out to those guys. Uh, hopefully, they appreciate it. Anyway, uh, what um, and there was saying I've got my reactions. Uh, what else is there gonna be? Um, Throwback Thursdays will be back with Pac Man World. Hopefully, I can get past that funhouse level. And podcast on a Friday as usual. So, with all that in mind, I will see you guys again very soon. Tomorrow, Tom and Jerry Sins is back. If you enjoyed what you saw, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Uh, my last video was Tom and Jerry Sins, which will be on the left. And on the right, dedicated Trophy Achievement Podcast playlist. So, with all that in mind, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for Tom and Jerry Sins. Have a fantastic day. Peace out. Stay faithful.